Okay, we'll take your Bibles and turn to Lamentations 3. Lamentations 3. And uh, we're going to look here, and then we're going to be in Psalms mostly. Um, but the, the title tonight is God is Faithful. God is Faithful. And that is a very direct statement. It's a very true statement. And it's something that we need to, to, to see and realize and, and understand that God is faithful. You know, we just sang the, the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And we need to... to let God know that we see His faithfulness. That it, I mean, His faithfulness is great. His faithfulness is wonderful. Um, you know, God can always be counted on. Like, are you counting on God right now? Are you counting on God in your everyday life? You can always depend on Him to do what He said He will do. And in times of difficulty, it's when we need to realize most of all trust most of all that God is faithful. We don't have to remind ourselves that God is faithful when we're being blessed, when we have um, you know, blessings in abundance and health is good and your job is good. And that's not when you have to remind yourself that God is faithful. And that's one of the reasons I think that God put this right in the middle of lamentations. And uh, I think that's very important. But we're going to, you know, to be faithful is to be reliable. And how faithful is God? You know, He's 100% reliable, 100% faithful. You know, if you have a car that's reliable 75% of the time, you'd say, well, that's better than 50%. Yeah, but that means one out of every four times you're stuck somewhere. You wouldn't count that as a faithful car. Uh, and I think a lot of Christians say, well, I'm faithful. I only miss church this often. I only miss devotions this often. I only, and of course most aren't 75% faithful, but we would never rely on a car that was only 75% faithful, you know, reliable. Um, but thankfully, we serve a God that is 100% faithful. He is always, always reliable. So we're going to see here, uh, in looking at God's faithfulness, we're going to see the Lord's mercy and, uh, when we look, we're, while we're looking at His faithfulness. But we're also going to see that God has perfect timing. So the Lord's mercy, the Lord's faithfulness, and the Lord's timing. Because often when you see uh, him talking about his faithfulness, he talks about mercy, and somewhere close by usually talks about waiting on the Lord. So we need to learn that God has the perfect timing. So in Lamentations chapter 3, and uh, we're going to start in verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. So we see mercy there, faithfulness there, and waiting for the Lord. Aren't you, aren't you thankful that God doesn't have any bad days? That He isn't just grumpy, you know, one day, have a bad attitude, wake, wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Uh, you, know, he, you know, here, He doesn't forget His mercies for us. He renews them day by day, every morning. Um, he's so faithful to do that. We're going to come back and, and kind of look at this again, look at Lamentations again. Uh, but that's where we get, you know, that song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great are His mercies, and, uh, you know, what a wonderful thing. But now what I want to do is go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. You know, and in Deuteronomy, there's several places where God makes it very clear that if the children of Israel obey Him, then He will bless them. But if they disobey 
him that they will suffer the consequences, and uh, he says that very often, and that's an important thing to realize when we talk about the faithfulness of God. Now, some of those things that he directly tells Israel uh, don't apply directly. The, the specific things might not apply directly to us, you know, that these exact things are going to happen to you, because um, he was talking to his the nation of Israel, but that idea still applies to us. You know, we find that in the New Testament, you reap what you sow. Uh, but in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 8 through 11, it says, But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen. For the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt... Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, and repay them that hate him to their face, to destroy them. He will not be slack to them that hateth him. He will repay him to his face." Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. So yes, God is merciful and he keeps his promises. But he promises to punish sin. God is not sitting back ignoring your sin. He will punish sin. You know, those who never trust Christ as their Savior are going to be in the lake of fire. They're going to be in hell forever and ever and ever, separated from God in the lake of fire. Uh, God does not tolerate sin. But even as Christians, yes, He has paid for that sin. We don't have to pay for that. We get to spend eternity in heaven. But here on this earth, we still reap what we sow. We do bad things. We will be punished for it. God does not ignore it. You know, when we have a, a bad attitude and try to ignore him, he will not let us ignore him. If, you know, he is just sitting back ignoring our sin, he could not be called faithful. He is faithful and, and just in what, he, in what he does. He, God, you know, God's not our faithful slave that is waiting to serve us whenever we get into trouble. You know, and we decide we need his help. Okay, I need your help now. And, you know, we expect him to, to jump in and, and do exactly what we say. No, when we disobey him, he is faithful to discipline us. He is faithful to do that. He always will, will follow through on that. He is the, the perfect heavenly father. When we ask for forgiveness, though, he is also faithful and just to forgive. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess that. If we ask for forgiveness to him, he wants to clear the air. He wants to, to cleanse us of that unrighteousness so that we can now faithfully serve him. So we can have a close walk with him. So there's nothing keeping us from, from walking with him. From having the power of the Spirit upon us. And God always, he always keeps his promises. You know, he doesn't break them ever. And this includes his conditional promises. He promises to give wisdom. But he also promises he will not give wisdom if we don't ask in faith. If we don't ask in faith, uh, he will not answer that request. He promises to answer prayer if we abide in Christ and Christ in us. So if we are not doing that, then he won't. Uh, he will draw near to us if we will draw near to him. He will draw near to us every single time that we draw near to him. He is faithful. If only we would be faithful to draw near to him. And he will always, always, always faithfully resist us if we are filled with pride. He says he resisteth, resisteth the proud. You know, and God doesn't change the rules. You know, unlike us people, 
you know, where we change the rules in, in order to benefit ourselves. And often, you know, if it's politics, we change the rules to not only benefit ourselves, but to hurt the other person, if at all possible. Uh, and, you know, we see that happen all the time. I think now we see that more now than we've ever, you know, seen, at least in our lifetimes, probably. Um, you know, even, you know, just today, the, the Senate had some hearings with leaders of Twitter and Facebook and Google and, and that, and they've proven that they have two different sets of rules depending on what your political view is. And, you know, they were letting... I, I saw today that, you know, Senator Ted Cruz was, was, was grilling the head of... or the I don't know if he's the head of Twitter, the guy that, you know, can censor stuff in charge of that department, and um, he was saying, so this stuff is not blocked. And he said, no, it's not. It hasn't been. You know, it was only blocked for 24 hours. Well, you go back to when that stuff first came out. I tried to, to, to put some of that stuff on, and it wouldn't, you couldn't put it on. Uh, well, even today, like while that was happening, Senator Cruz tried to put one of those things on, and it wouldn't go through. But then just after that, it would go through. So they still had it set up wrong. Well, they, but they changed the rules depending on what it is. And, you know, it's a, a fluid thing. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to hypocrisy. You know, many um, politicians, reporters, and others are complete hypocrites when it comes to masks. Uh, you know, they, it's not that they'll wear it in one place and not in another. It's that they will lambast people who don't wear masks but then as soon as the camera's off, you know, they take theirs off and they, you know, disregard all the things that they just tore the other person about. So they have different rules for different people for different times and all of that. Well, we have a God that is always faithful and he doesn't change the rules. He's not always, he's not like the, the governor of California right now with all of their restrictions and he keeps moving the goalposts, uh, making it harder and harder to, um, to do things. But we must understand that people are unfaithful. People will be unfaithful. It's not, it shouldn't be, it's not an excuse, um, but God is always faithful. God never lets us down. Never lets us down. So here's a question I want you to, to think about, and, uh, and so maybe we'll talk about this afterwards, and if you're watching on, on YouTube, you can put it in the comments down. You can answer, I have two questions. Um, that I'll be asking in this message, and you can answer them in the comments, or if you're one of our church people, you can put it in the, you know, in our distribution text. You could answer these questions. But the first one is: Have you ever felt like God let you down? So not did God let you down, but have you ever felt like God let you down, or you temporarily accused God of letting you down? God, why did you let this happen? God, God. Um, you know, how could you let this happen? Or where are you? You know, and the psalmist says things like that quite often throughout there. You know, do you hear me? Um, and often we might feel like God has let us down. Like, how could this happen if God is in control? If God is, is sovereign, if he's, how could this happen? Uh, but God is always faithful. And... If we felt that way, or when, I should say when we have felt that way, probably everyone, I know I have felt that way before, when we have felt that way, uh, it is, is it a problem with God, or is it a problem with us? Well, of course, it's a problem with us. Now, hopefully, if you feel that way, it's a very short period of time, you know, because mo- a lot of the Psalms that start that kind of way, by the end of the Psalm, it's the opposite, you know, it's trusting in the Lord. And all that, and I've been that way many times, you know, crying out to God. But then, within a few minutes, you know, you feel back in fellowship with God. Yes, He is faithful and He's in control. But when we do have that, it those those feelings, it's a problem with our feelings, and it reveals a spiritual problem, uh, something that needs to be solved that only God can solve. You know, sometimes we we don't enjoy the benefits of God's promises. Uh, though, because we haven't done what he told us to do. You know, so we don't have the wisdom because we're not asking in faith. Uh, Or he's not drawing near to us because we're not drawing near to him. Some of those things, but there's other times that God decides, no, you need to go through this time to learn to wait on me. 
to learn to trust me. And uh, so now we're going to be in the book of, of Psalms. You see most of our, our verses there are in Psalms. Uh, but the first one here is in Psalm 36 and verse 5. Psalm 36 and verse 5. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. His faithfulness isn't just something to think about every once in a while, but it should be all-consuming, that we always realize His faithfulness, that we don't let our doubts overtake the thought that, that He is faithful. It should be something that, you know, if something is reaching the clouds, you wouldn't be able to walk outside without noticing it. I mean, it would be so huge. Well, we wouldn't, shouldn't be able to go anywhere with noticing, with, without realizing that God is, is faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. Uh, the second question I want you to think about. So the first one, have you ever felt like God let you down? Uh, you know, or was not faithful? Uh, the next one is, can you think of a time that God showed his faithfulness? Can you think of a time that God showed his faithfulness? And so in in those two questions, don't just think, well, yes and no, but try to think of a time, or, you know, later, you try to think of a time that, yes, maybe you doubted his faithfulness, but then another time, you know, God showed his faithfulness. And now let's look at Psalm 25, verses 6 through 11. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. And then down in verse 21, let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. God's faithfulness, it's not that he's just always faithful, but his faithfulness is a benefit to us. Because of God's faithfulness, you know, many things happen. So looking through this passage here, because of his faithfulness, remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been of ever old. Because of his faithfulness, we get to enjoy his tender mercies. And his loving kindness. Uh, and, you know, his mercy is, you know, we don't get the punishment that we deserve. You know, the thing that we, de we deserve. Grace is he gives us an, basically an abundance that we don't deserve. But mercy with, with, withholds uh, judgment that we would deserve. Uh, but also, because of his faithfulness, uh, says, according to thy tender mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. And then good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. So not only do we get to experience his mercy, you know, really to experience God's mercy, uh, you know, you don't practice mercy on somebody who's perfect. You know, so we can't practice mercy on God. Uh, but God practices mercy on us. So what does that mean? We're sinners. Like the Bible says, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, then it says, therefore, he will teach sinners in the way. That is something God is faithful to do. Along the way, whether it's a hard way or an easy way, God is faithful to teach us. So God's faithfulness always benefits us. Then it says, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Here's another conditional promise. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such 
as do what? Keep his covenant and his testimony. So when you follow the word of God, God will direct you on the path, on the, the path you should, should always be on. And then for thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. We all need to come to that realization that our iniquity is great. I think the greater we see God's faithfulness, the greater we will see our lack of faithfulness at times uh, and see that, yes, my iniquity is great. And then down in verse 21 was, let integrity and uprightness preserve me. You know, just the fact that God is faithful shows integrity, something that can be counted on, that's always there, that's always supportive, that will, will never let you down. Uh, but that will preserve us, for I wait on thee. Maybe we don't always realize it when we ought to realize it, but wait on the Lord. So his faithfulness is a benefit to us always. And then in Psalm 27, in verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me, and answer me. Remember that, you know, like I've said, when often when thinking about the mercies of God, uh, you know, he mentions his faithfulness, but I think we need to think about our responsibility to wait on the Lord. If you're thinking about the mercies of God, that he is merciful unto us, shouldn't that kind of get us to, to wait on the Lord? You know, okay, if he's merciful unto me. Uh, now, it's easy to think, well, if God's faithful, then I should learn to wait on him. But even just because he's merciful, we need to learn to, to wait on him. Um, so here the psalmist, you know, crying with his voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. But his mercies are great. They are renewed every day, but we should still, I think, pray for them because that, I think, is acknowledging our iniquity and how great it is. But now in, down in verse 14, it says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. God's faithfulness is going to be a benefit to us. It always is. But we might not realize it right now, but it is, and we will realize it. It may be through His mercy that is a benefit to us. It may be through answered prayer that's a benefit to us. Or it could be through a trial that it is a benefit. But God's faithfulness is always a benefit. So it says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. He promises that he will strengthen our heart. But we have to wait on the Lord. Be of a good courage. Wait on him and he will do that. Believe that God is faithful. And if we believe that God is faithful, we will be of a good courage, and we're going to hope in the Lord. Uh, as we talked about Sunday, you know, that we should have that hope in the Lord. He will fortify us for the, for the task ahead. He will strengthen our heart. In uh, Psalm 119, verse 75, it says, I know, O oh Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast, hast afflicted me. So sometimes, yes, his faithfulness, it's benefiting us through an affliction, through a trial. It might not seem like a blessing. It might not seem like it's benefiting us. You know, depending on how the election goes next week, we might think, you know, God, are you being faithful? How is this going to benefit me? Um, but uh, either way, whether it's God's blessing us or whether God is saying, no, you need judgment, uh, it, will, it will benefit us. Um, we can walk closer to God, uh, either however God decides uh, to work. In uh, Psalm 31 in verse 24, 
says, Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. So we saw that, that twice there. It will strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. So don't stop hoping in the Lord. Not wishing kind of thing, but a confident expectation of good, or as I said on Sunday, a confident expectation of God. That God's going to do something. I expect it. I know that He is going to strengthen my heart. That He is faithful, always faithful. Not that He's going to be faithful, but He's not now. No, He is always faithful. Yes, He's going to be faithful, but that doesn't exclude the fact that He is faithful right now. Now, we started in Lamentations. And I want to go back there. So, Jeremiah and then Lamentations. And so, we looked in verses, I think it was 22 to 26. I mean, so it's right, it's probably almost, it's probably literally, you know, exactly in the middle of the book. There's five chapters there, and this is the middle of, of chapter 3. Uh, and before this, you know, he's lamenting the trials and the things that are happening happening to the city of Jerusalem and all the people in Jerusalem, and he's just you know, bewailing this, and, you know, mine eyes do fail with tears, my bowels are troubled, my liver is poured out upon the earth. I mean, just all of this, this weeping, he's lamenting about what is happening. And uh, then right in the middle of that, he says, it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. And then, you know, every morning God's mercies are renewed, great is thy faithfulness. Does that mean that you think after that that the, there's no more lamentation? Once he realized God's faithfulness, once he came back to acknowledging God's faithfulness, was everything fine? No. I mean, there's more lamentations. I mean, he just keeps lamenting as he, as he goes on. Uh, and some of these things, I think it's, it's hard to comprehend the wickedness of the things that were going on. But this is something we need to think about. Here, God was not remembered. You know, Jeremiah was not remembering God's mercy and faithfulness while he was uh, in the, the midst of a mountaintop experience. He was remembering the faithfulness of God, the mercies of God, while he was in more of a valley of the shadow of death kind of experience, where it would be hard to find some, you know, a worse position that he could be in you know, humanly speaking, and he's in that moment acknowledging that great is thy faithfulness. Your mercies are renewed every morning, even though I don't have food in the morning. I don't have, you know, everything was, was so horrible that way. God was faithful. His mercies were renewed day by day. So don't just think, you know, be thankful for God's faithfulness when things are doing well. Or don't just think about His faithfulness while things are going well. No, we need to be thankful and think of His faithfulness when we are fearful, when we are hurting, when it seems like nothing is going right. Remember that, yes, God is always faithful even in those moments. When we are seeing great blessings, He doesn't have to, to tell us uh, you know, that he's faithful. But when things are, are not doing so, going so well, you know, that's when we need to be reminded. We need to be like Jeremiah in that regard, that we don't only realize it ourselves, but we tell it to other people. Yes, this is happening, but God is faithful. Well, Maybe they weren't going through that bad of a time, you might think. Well, just look, look at one verse over in chapter 4 and verse 10. The hands of the pitiful woman have sodden their own children. They were their meat in the destruction of the daughter of my people. Now, sodden, kind of, well, what does that even mean? You know, it almost sounds like, you know, they got wet in the rain and they didn't dry them off or something. You know, no, this is beyond 
imagination how horrible this is. In other places, this, this, the word here is translated boil, bake, or roast. So they were cooking their own children for, because they were hungry. Uh, we can't imagine that wickedness. And this is, these are the things that Jeremiah was seeing that was happening around him. And he could say, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. I just saw a news article today that a, uh, uh, this article says a, uh, a pregnant supermodel, Emily Ratajowski, uh, is she and her husband said that they, they won't know the gender of their baby until our child is 18, and they'll let us know then. Uh, went on to say, I guess it was an essay that she wrote, went on to say, I like the idea, I like the idea of forcing as few gender stereotypes on my child as possible. Uh, and then she went on to say that, um, she does, but she doesn't like that we force gender-based preconceptions onto people, let alone babies. It's just so much foolishness. Uh, I want to be a parent who allows my child to show themselves to me, and yet I realize that while I may hope my child uh, can determine their own place in the world, they will, no matter what, be faced with the undeniable constraints and constructions of gender before they can speak or even be born. So these constraints will already be put on them before they're even born, which, you know, isn't it amazing that the people, for the most part, who would say something like this also think abortion is okay? So you won't force a constraint of what gender your child is, but if you decide to kill them, that's okay. And yet, I'm sure that they would look at Lamentations 4.10 and say, wow, what wickedness. I mean, we can't imagine the wickedness. But then I read that story and I can't imagine the wickedness. Whether it's you know, something like that or the, you know, the act of a, abortion. Which that right there, um, that's child abuse. You know, so, you know, it describes Gusts us as it as it should that the mothers in Jerusalem were sacrificing their children for their own satisfaction, but parents are doing the same thing today, whether it is through abortion or a long drown, drawn out form of child abuse like what we just read. That's a long drawn out. That's child abuse over these these years. That's and that's sacrificing the well being of that child for their own wicked conscience sake, for their own thoughts, their own beliefs that are contrary to truth, uh, scientific truth, uh, biblical truth, which, of course, do not contradict each other. Such wickedness. So even when we find things like this going on amongst ourselves, you know, in that poor child, you know, the chance of suicide because they have parents like that, it's guaranteed to skyrocket. Guaranteed. Because um, they're going to confuse that child. Uh, but you look at these things, and you can find many other examples. And I don't want to just you know, pick on that person. That person needs Jesus Christ as their Savior. They need to realize that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. And there's millions and millions across this country and, and billions around this world that need Jesus Christ um, that are in the same position. But we might look around us and, and think like, you know, it's, it's harder to see God's faithfulness because we're not seeing God working in some cases. Um, but don't forget, God is faithful. It may get worse. It may continue to get worse. It may never get better in this country. We don't know. We don't know when, I mean, the rapture could happen tomorrow, and then, of course, it's really downhill from, from there. But I pray that our country will turn around, that as Christians, we will have revival in our, in our lives, and that will affect our communities, that will affect our nation, that that would affect the world. But that 
might not happen. It might just get worse and worse. The Bible promises in the last days it's going to get worse and worse. We just don't know if we're, we might not be there yet. But either, either way, God is faithful. He is always faithful. We know that God can turn things around. But in the meantime, we must trust in the Lord. We must wait on the Lord because He is faithful. And if we wait on the Lord, what, will he, what does He promise to do? We saw twice tonight that He'll strengthen our heart. And Isaiah... 40 says, wait on the Lord and he will renew your strength. So you can run and not be weary. And he says, you can mount up with wings as eagles. Uh, And then here we see some instructions of what, uh, what we ought to do. In Psalm 40 in verse 10, it says, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. And then in Psalm 89, verses 1 and 2, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. And then in that same chapter, Psalm 89 and verse 5, and the heavens shall praise thy wonders. O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. Make known God's faithfulness. So if we understand it, once we understand the faithfulness of God, we need to let that His faithfulness be made known to other people. If we are faithful, if, if we realize that God is faithful, we will be more faithful ourselves. And we will want to share God's faithfulness with other people people. So God is faithful and that faithfulness will benefit you and it will benefit me. So trust him. Learn to wait on the Lord and he will renew your strength. Remember the two questions I asked you. Have you ever felt like God let you down? And can you think of a time that God showed his faithfulness? So God is always faithful. You know, I mentioned before that everyone are sinners. Every one of us are sinners. We come short of the glory of God. And that if that sin is not paid for, you'll spend eternity in hell forever. Well, I want to explain to all of you watching uh, online how you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. God does not want you to go to hell. In fact, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who was God, to die in your place, to die in my place. See, the payment of sin is death. So Jesus came to die in our place. So I'm going to let this hand represent you and represent me, and I'm going to let my wallet here represent sin. See, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That sin separates us from God. The Bible says the payment of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. But The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you do not have to die and spend eternity in hell forever because Jesus came to this earth. And in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world, that's you, God so loved you, that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever, again, that's you, believeth on him, should not perish but have everlasting life. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and that he was buried and the third day he rose again, then you don't have to spend eternity in hell. You will spend eternity in heaven. You don't have to perish. You will have everlasting life. If you will trust Jesus and Jesus alone as your Savior, that he hung on that cruel cross of Calvary, shedding his blood, took our sin upon him, died to pay for that sin, was buried, and the third day he rose again, showing that that payment was accepted. So now you can have that payment applied to your account by trusting Jesus Christ alone as your Savior. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, 
lest any man should boast. You cannot earn your own salvation. It is not possible. The only payment is death. So if you die with that sin on you, you will spend eternity in hell forever. So let me challenge you right now. Put your faith, put your trust, your belief in Jesus alone for your salvation. And you, if you just did that, you could know for sure that you're going to heaven. And I'd love to be able to, to pray with you and uh, you know, talk with you if you just trusted Christ as your Savior. So please, text us, call us, email us, let us know that you trusted Christ as your Savior. Uh, or if this message was a blessing to you, we would love to hear from you uh, as well. And if you live in our area, why don't you come, please join us uh, on Sunday morning. Uh, we would love to have you or any of our services. Uh, you can go to calvaryflorida.com to find out more information about our church. Uh, but we would love to have you uh, worship with us uh, in one of our services. And, um, but I hope this message was a challenge to you and that you would realize that God is faithful. And if you are already a believer, you know, that you would you know, realize that and wait on the Lord. and He will renew your strength. Until next time, thank you and God bless.